Welcome, everyone, to the second plenary session of the conference. My name is Bill Skatch, and it is a real pleasure to be here this morning with all of you to learn about all the exciting progress that we're making that is going on all around us here at this conference. Yesterday, we heard from Dr. Clancy, who gave an outstanding update on the recent overviews and advances for personalized medicine and how CF is really leading the way in this area. And if you think about it, Many of the topics he discussed yesterday, therotyping, organoids, precision medicine, weren't really even in our vernacular. They weren't even in the discussion five years ago. And today we're hearing about how these new technologies are changing the lives of CF patients. This morning we'll hear about how new discoveries are being translated into new therapies and some of the most promising strategies to expand and accelerate participation in clinical research. But before we get started with that, I'd like to remember one of the great leaders who helped pave the way for our current success and present the Richard C. Talamo Distinguished Clinical Achievement Award to three very well-deserving investigators. This is one of the highest honors given by the CF Foundation and recognizes outstanding physicians whose contributions embody Dr. Talamo's legacy to our community. Dr. Talamo graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College and got his medical degree at Boston University. He then pursued a career in pediatrics at the NIH, working under one of the great researchers in CF, Paul de San Ignace. And as a professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Talamo became deeply committed to the mission of the, C of the, mission of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, serving in many capacities, including the Medical Advisory Committee and the Board of Trustees. His efforts had a profound impact in shaping the research medical infrastructure and encouraging numerous outstanding individuals to focus on this disease in their careers. Sadly, Dr. Talamo died prematurely at the age of 47. We remember him today in presenting this award to three outstanding clinician, research, clinician researchers from Australia. These individuals have transformed the landscape of CF research and care for young children by studying three basic questions. When does lung damage first begin in young children? How can it be diagnosed through early surveillance? And how can disease monitoring best inform when to begin therapy? These are really pretty simple questions, but they have profound impact in how we look at the new treatments that are coming forward and when to institute them. Their work has really established a paradigm shift in therapy which instead of being focused on the treatment of active disease, is now focused on aggressive prevention of early lung damage that can start even in infancy. Our first recipient is Dr. Peter Sly, Director of the Department of Children's Health and Environment. Professor Sly is the Director of the Department of Children's Health and Development, the Deputy Director of the Queensland Medical Research Institute, and Senior Principal Research Fellow at the University of Queensland. For more than three decades, Dr. Sly has been an international leader in pediatric respiratory research. His studies combining animal models, community-based lung studies, and innovative measurements of early lung function have helped set an international agenda for the primary prevention of lung disease in infants with CF. Our second recipient is Professor Stephen Stick. <clears throat> Professor Stick is head of the Department of Respiratory Medicine at Princess Margaret Hospital for Children and associate director of the Telethon's the Telethon Kids Institute in Perth, Western Australia. Since 2005, Dr. Stick has been the principal investigator of the Arrest CF Surveillance Program, which has helped determine the risk factors and predictors for the onset of bronchiectasis, one of the earliest types of lung damage in infants. Results of these studies indicate that treatments targeting bronchiectasis can have long-ranging benefits throughout life. He also administered the first intervention trial, known as Combat CF, testing the use of azithromycin for the delay and prevention of bronchiectasis in newborns. Our third recipient is Claire Wainwright. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Claire 
Dr. Wainwright is a pediatric respiratory physician and lead for the Cystic Fibrosis Services at the Lady Salento Children's Hospital in Brisbane, professor of pediatrics and child health with the University of Queensland, and adjunct professor in the Faculty of Health at Queensland University of Technology. She has made seminal contributions to our understanding of early childhood lung disease, particularly in the area of molecular diagnosis of infectious organisms, the use of bronchial alveolar lavage in young children, and risk factors for airway damage. For their many contributions in improving and in promoting health in children with CF, I am proud to present the Talamo Award to Professors Sly, Stick, and Wainwright. Please come up and accept this award with our gratitude for all you have done. did say, be careful not to let it fall. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great honour for, um, for the three of us to be here, and I would just particularly like to acknowledge the fact that the RSCF program that Steve and I started um, before 2005, but became a RSCF in 2005, would not have done so without the financial and um, academic support from the CFFT. They gave us our first grant to actually put this program together and have been supporting us ever since. So uh, this recognition belongs to them as well. Well, this is a huge honour and a, a big thank you to the CF Foundation. I also want to just say thank you to all my team who are you know, without whom I could never have done any of the work I've done, and to my clinical team and all the collaborators. At the end of the day, research these days is a massive team effort, and a big, big thank you to all those parents and children who have taken part in all the research. So it's a massive family of CF, so thank you. Thanks for this fantastic honour. Um, I'd reiterate everything that my colleagues have said. Uh, and I'd just like to say I was lucky to go to Australia from the UK at a time when CF research was really taking off. Thanks largely to people like uh, Lou Lando, who was one of the grandfathers of uh, early paediatric pulmonology, along with uh, Lynn Tausig and Simon Goffrey and Mary Ellen Wall. And uh, to my fantastic mentor, Peter, who uh, uh, with, with his help, we were able to get the RSCF uh, program, the Combat CF programs going. So thank you very much. Be careful with those, Jackie. They, <laughs> I think Preston said it best yesterday that in coming to the foundation a year and a half ago, I have just had the privilege to work with tremendous people. And it is my pleasure to introduce one of those people now, um, Mike, Dr. Mike Boyle, who will introduce the, the next plenary speaker. Many of you know Mike from his work in CF clinical research and clinical care. He's the senior vice president for uh, therapeutic development at this foundation, and he is the professor, a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University. There's really no one better to introduce the next speaker because Mike is now really the lead person at the CF Foundation to design, implement, and really overcome the challenges for the next generation of clinical trials. So with that, please welcome Mike Boyle to the stage. Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege to be able to introduce today's uh, plenary speaker, Dr. George Retch Bogart. George is a professor of pediatrics at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. 
and the longtime faculty director of the CF Foundation's TDN Network Operations. George was actually born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and completed his college degree and medical school training at the University of Cincinnati before doing his pediatric residency at the University of Minnesota. He then moved to God's country, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to complete his pediatric pulmonology fellowship at UNC. Immediately after fellowship, he joined the University of North Carolina pediatric pulmonology faculty, where over the next 25 years he rose to full professor and division director. George has a long history of CF clinical research contributions. He has over 50 CF-related publications and played a part in the development of Pulmozyme, Toby, and was one of the lead investigators for both the case and Epic trials. But the truth is he's played a significant role in making all U.S. CF clinical trials possible over the last decade. This is through his role in the CF Foundation's Therapeutic Development Network. George has been a key member of TDN leadership since the TDN started in 1999. He spent five years as either the vice chair or the chair of the TDN steering committee before being installed as the faculty director of network operations in 2013. Basically what happened was that when, when George's uh, term ended, everybody said, George, the network's not going to work without you here. You're never allowed to leave. <laughs> George is also a great clinician who is devoted to his patients. For the last decade, he's annually been selected to the best doctors in America list. I learned just how devoted his patients are to him recently. He had uh, uh, referred us a patient who had moved up to, uh, from North Carolina to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and George had taken care of her for many years. We really rolled out the red carpet for her. We spent almost three hours with her, meeting everybody on the team, and building this, working with her to get this comprehensive list of all of her, you know, her care plan. At the very end, I checked back in with her just to, to wrap up the visit, and uh, she said, oh yeah, all this is pretty good and all, but I better check with Dr. Rich Bogart. <laughs> so, to which I said, that sounds really wise. So when not spending take, time taking care of patients and making clinical trials in the U.S. work, George is the proud husband of Carol and the proud father to two grown sons, Sam and Alex. George is going to be speaking to us this, this, this morning about clinical trials giving us an overview of not only what is occurring now, but how we'll need to join together as a CF community to be able to complete these clinical trials that are going to bring new therapies to patients. The title of his talk today is Opening Doors to Clinical Research, Change is Coming. So please join me in welcoming Dr. George Rech Bogart to the stage. Wow. Um, JP said yesterday that this is a big room, and it wasn't until the room was empty that I realized this morning just how cavernous this is. So um, uh, it's kind of a daunting task to stand up here and see all these empty chairs now filled with uh, faces. Um, and it really is an honor for me to talk to you all this morning because this is an incredible time in the history of CF. Uh, there is so much going on. There's so much progress that's being made. There's so many people looking to us to uh, continue to make changes and progress and to be a model for a lot of other disease-focused groups. Um, because we are a really unique community and everybody here has such a passion for what they do regardless of what aspect of CF they are uh, influencing. So it's given me a, t a chance to th reflect on where we are and where we're going and uh, think about the significance of the foundation uh, as well as some of the challenges that we're going to be uh, grappling with in the coming years. These are good challenges to have. So as a community, um, working with the CF Foundation, we've initiated uh, many novel programs. And these have reflected our appreciation for the fact that we need new approaches uh, apply to really reach all of our goals. And it's made us familiar with both the excitement and the anxiety that comes with being on the cutting edge of medicine and of research. And it reflects a belief that improvement and change are necessary to move us all forward. So today I want to talk about another change that's coming for us. Yesterday, J.P. Clancy broadened our vision of what's happening as he explained the full meaning of personalized medicine in his plenary talk. This morning I want to take off from there and follow a different path, a path to making clinical research very personal, to making it a personal conversation with our patients. Actually, it's a conversation that started at the very beginning of the CF Foundation's uh, founding. And it, it's one that continues today and one that will most certainly continue into the future. Back in the 60s, 
when I was diagnosed, my parents were told I wasn't going to live till 10, that I would be lucky to live till 10. And that would be a really gruesome bunch of years, up to, you know, 10. Unfortunately, my parents are gone. I lost my mom 40 years ago, which breaks my heart. But I know that she is in heaven going, damn, oh my gosh. You are still here kicking it, and the foundation has come up with these unbelievable therapies, drugs, tools, technologies that have promoted my daughter's life and the thousands of others with CF. It's just, I love to tell my story because of my age, because I can prove it. I can tell people what drugs there weren't and what there are now. And I've been there, done that, seen it all happen. And we are on the road. We are on the road to a cure. I just, I, I know it. So I've watched this segment many times, but uh, I'm still so moved by her message and the power of her words because it really captures um, from her perspective, the spirit of what it is we're all doing every day. So the CF Foundation was originally called the National Cystic Fibrosis Research Foundation. And so from the very beginning, our roots were deeply set in research with the goal of developing better outcomes for our, parent, our patients and eventually a cure. And as Bob said yesterday, it was founded by, patient, by parents of patients who formed a partnership with physicians um, and they believed passionately that research would make a difference. Um, and they didn't accept the status quo. So, this is what we learned from the first plenary session. It's the importance of therapies directed towards specific gene mutations um, and also the assessing the individual response to therapy and the need for effective therapies regardless of the CF gene mutation that a patient has. And it gave us a sense of how to begin thinking about the application of personalized therapy to CF care. And the fact that we're going to need to use new measurements and tools for improving both adherence and engagement of our patients. So although we don't have time to talk about every single study that is really, really important, um, I've decided that we're going to shift the focus and pick out some studies that highlight some themes that to me are really important about what's going on and then link to some of the things we're going to talk about later. So we have our, our cascade of the pathophysiology of CF and we're going to start with CFTR modulators. And there is a CFTR modulator that's currently under development. This is a GSNOR inhibitor that is an orally bioavailable agent that increases concentrations of GSNO in the cell. And this compound has a role in modulating protein function. And everybody probably remembers how critical protein function is to CFTR. And we believe that this may act as a new type of CFTR modulator and may have multiple sites of action. So in this diagram, you can see a basic outline of a cell. And on the left side is the pattern of trafficking from the synthesis of CFTR up to the cell surface and in two areas um, that are highlighted in the blue circles where a corrector and a potentiator would exert their effect. Now this molecule uh, interacts with chaperone proteins that are really critical to the folding, the correct folding of proteins uh, and it may reduce the chance of CFTR degradation um, by a couple of different pathways and also may stabilize CFTR at the cell surface. I think that there is some evidence that the combination of lumicaftor and ivacaftor actually can destabilize CFTR at some point. So the phase 1b study uh, of this compound is done. It was a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial that enrolled 51 patients at 19 TDN centers in tested doses of placebo, 50, 100, and 200 milligrams twice daily as a monotherapy. It was 28 days followed by a two-week withdrawal and follow-up period. The primary endpoints in this phase one study were really safety and pharmacokinetics. The exploratory endpoints uh, that we always include are measures of lung function, sweat chloride, and inflammatory biomarkers because this compound may also have some influence on 
airway inflammation. So the, the um, overall summary uh, is that they showed a very good safety profile. The dose was well tolerated for the entire 28-day period, and for the measurements of sweat chloride in particular, there seemed to be a threshold dose effect. So if you would like the details of this, so I don't um, say, uh, uh, capture somebody's thunder, Dr. Donaldson will be talking about this later today uh, in workshop 14, uh, early studies of novel small molecule therapies. There also are two posters, poster 250 and 270, that uh, illustrate the details of this phase one study. Plans are currently in place for a phase two study. What's important to know about this study is that this will be adding this uh, novel agent to the combination of Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor uh, in adults homozygous for the F508 mutation. It'll be, again, a um, double-blind randomized controlled trial in parallel groups of three treatment arms. Um, the primary endpoint here will be the absolute change in percent predicted FEV1, uh, 12 weeks of treatment followed by uh, a four-week uh, follow-up period, and it's uh, targeted to start at the uh, latter part of this year. This is imp uh, an important thing to note that as we get more and more patients on CFTR modul modulator therapies clinically, it will become an increasingly difficult challenge to then decide how you're going to continue assessing new uh, CFTR modulators. So here's an instance where we can actually uh, look at the effectiveness of an add-on therapy to uh, patients already on um, Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor. So as we get more and more therapies tested and approved in adolescents and adults, we really have to confront the issue of, you know, how do we bring these down to younger age groups uh, and demonstrate efficacy? Um, so how do you test the efficacy of a therapy in patients that have normal lung function? One of the most exciting developments is that multiple breath washout has come back, and the uh, use of lung clearance index is now being uh, tested very rigorously to find out if this can be a good outcome measure for those with uh, early or mild lung disease. And for those not familiar with the technique, patients uh, or participants uh, inhale a, a, a mixture of ga uh, gas, and then uh, we analyze the um, uh, exhaled gas, in this case it's uh, nitrogen, uh, and a breath-by-breath -breath analysis to determine the efficiency or evenness of ventilation. So the lung clearance index re reflects the evenness or uniformity of ventilation in the lung, and unlike FEV1, a higher value in an LCI is not good. Uh, you want to be able to have lower values, meaning it takes fewer breaths to reach uh, an equilibrium state. So one question is, so is it more sensitive than traditional lung function testing? I think we have data to say yes. And uh, can it be used in children and in clinical trials? And so that uh, evidence is now emerging and will also likely be yes. Uh, the proof is in a recently completed longitudinal study of, C of LCI that is led by uh, Dr. Ratchin from Toronto, uh, an NIH-funded study looking at M MBW in children. And it's really looking at the feasibility of testing children, uh, looking at the performance of uh, LCI and its stability over time, as well as the impact of a pulmonary exacerbation, a clinical situation that we're quite familiar with, and that uh, it, certainly we know it impacts FEV1 in older patients. Uh, this is critical information for use in clinical trials and will uh, likely be important clinically as this is scaled down to uh, clinic use. Results will be presented later today in Symposium 10 and also in posters 191, 191, 242, and it's likely to be featured in an exciting pro-con debate on Saturday that will address the issue of uh, lung function testing in early childhood. Uh, LCI has also been looked at in a therapy that's already been approved, uh, Ivacaftor. Jane Davies and her group did a, uh, a study with a crossover design that was done in the UK, the US, and in Canada and compared Ivacaftor to placebo therapy for 28 days. These patients had excellent lung function. To be eligible, you had an FEV1 over 90% predicted, and certainly a G551D mutation to get Ivacaftor. Uh, patients were six years and uh, older, and actually patients that enrolled uh, ranged in age from eight to 43. So we got information about the performance of this as an outcome in an older age group with mild lung disease. The results showed a treatment difference uh, that is illustrated in the graph to the right um, for those on treatment compared to placebo. 
Uh, one thing to point out is that when we think about FEV1, this is primarily influenced by large airway flow resistance, whereas we believe that changes in LCI really looking at the evenness in the distribution of ventilation are likely to affect more peripheral airway disease, which is what happens early in the genesis of lung disease in CF. Uh, lastly, um, uh, MBW and LCI is being used as a primary outcome measure in a vertex trial, um, 809-109 in which patients uh, 6 to 11 years of age will be getting Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor, um, and this study is now ongoing. It'll be exciting to see the results of this as well. Uh, <clears throat> one additional word about the use of uh, MBW and LCI. Um, we know that hypertonic saline improves mucosal clearance in uh, older patients with CF. Um, uh, the ISIS trial, uh, which had been completed in enrolled uh, children under the age of 6, Hypertonic saline was not seen to affect the rate of the primary endpoint, which is the rate of pulmonary exacerbations. However, in a very important small uh, sub-study uh, conducted in Toronto, the effect of hypertonic saline was actually seen in um, preschool age children. And so this provided the rationale to look for um, the effect of hypertonic saline in this age group. We also know that LCI improves in school age children with CF. So basically, this SHIP study, which is now ongoing, um, being led by Stephanie Davis, Felix Ratchin, and uh, Margaret Rosenfeld, is looking at the effect of hypertonic saline versus isotonic saline over a 48-week treatment period in children three to six years of age, the primary outcome again being the LCI. So if we switch to theme two, um, looking at our cascade, we are faced with uh, kind of a problematic infection. MRSA and CF has been a growing problem. Um, about 14 years ago, the prevalence of MRSA in our population was 2%, and over the subsequent years, it's risen to 25%. So this presents a formidable challenge to clinicians in knowing how to manage this uh, uh, growing problem, which maybe has plateaued if, um, if the data prove to be um, robust. So um, if, in thinking about the treatment options for MRSA, um, exacerbations are often treated with IV vancomycin or linazolid, but there are issues with these therapies because of toxicity. Um, we've learned recently that there's a difference in how chronic MRSA is handled in the adult population versus in children, where um, cycles of oral antibiotics are commonly used in adults with CF to suppress uh, persistent infection, whereas in children it's typically used to only to treat exacerbations in those uh, infected with MRSA. And um, for some patients, uh, they're receiving off-label use of um, IV formulations of vancomycin through a nebulizer. So it is a significant problem for some of our patients for two main reasons. Uh, can you eradicate MRSA when it's first acquired? And what do you do with chronic MRSA infection? So the STAR-2 trial, uh, also recently completed, evaluated uh, the question of how can we eradicate uh, newly acquired MRSA? This was led by Marianne Mielbach and Chris Goss with funding from the CF Foundation. Uh, it had two arms. One was a treatment arm for eradication and the other was an observation arm. Uh, and, the and the outcome looked at was the presence or absence of MRSA in a culture at day 28 after enrollment. This study enrolled 45 patients over 14 centers and the majority of these were children. They were, uh, and the interesting outcome at the end of the study was that the treated group, 67% uh, uh, eradicated MRSA, whereas those in the observational arm, only 13% had eradication. The full presentation of this will be um, later today by Chris Goss at Symposium 11. One thing I need to point out is that the STAR-2 trial took two years to enroll. Um, it started at a time when the rate of new acquisition of MRSA was reaching a plateau, making it very challenging to find eligible subjects. Um, and if it wasn't for the interest of the CF Foundation to extend the enrollment to two years, uh, if this was an industry-sponsored study, it's likely it would have been shut down after one year. But because of feedback from the CF community and the knowledge that this would be a study that may not be replicated, um, everybody continued to work extremely hard to get to a point where the study could be completed and the data analyzed. Shifting over to inhaled vancomycin therapy, looking at patients who may need suppressive treatment for their chronic MRSA, uh, this is a similar concept to what we do for Pseudomonas, use of inhaled tobramycin or is or colistin. 
So um, Aerovanc is the first inhaled MRSA antibiotic. Um, it's a dry powder formulation of vancomycin that's delivered in a novel device that's illustrated here. And in the photograph to the left of the slide, you can see the small, very uh, carefully engineered particles that deliver in a high efficiency way to the lower airways. The phase two study for Aerovanc has been completed. Uh, this involved two dosing cohorts of 32 milligrams twice daily and 64 milligrams twice daily. The primary endpoint was the uh, amount of MRSA in sputum, a number of secondary endpoints such as lung function, uh, respiratory symptoms, and the time to need uh, for additional antibiotic therapy were part of the outcome measured. Um, this will be presented in detail again at a symposium later today, Symposium 11. I think that symposium is going to get a lot of attention, um, which is a good thing. Uh, and there are preparations to plan for the phase three study, uh, which will require uh, many more patients uh, and give us an outcome uh, likely reflecting in lung function. So we're going to turn to our third theme, and that really reflects pulmonary exacerbations. This is a problem that is very common uh, in our patients, and this slide from the um, CF patient registry is really striking in the fact that over this past decade, we've really had not any change, uh, appreciable change in the rate of uh, patient or the percent of patients treated for exacerbations, whether they are adult uh, or children. And there are a number of questions that are relevant and familiar to everybody in terms of how we treat exacerbations. Which antibiotics do we pick? How long do we treat? What outcomes are we going to measure to mark improvement? When do we start treatment? Do we start it early? Do we do home monitoring to get a uh, threshold? Uh, or do we wait until it's convenient or somebody shows up in clinic and, and has postponed uh, changing uh, symptoms until that time? Do we use steroids? And do we treat at home or in the hospital? So in order to answer these questions, which are um, truly important for all of us since we have a lot, there's a, a tremendous lack of evidence for this, um, the STOP study, the standardized treatment of pulmonary exacerbations, uh, was conducted. And it was really a pilot and feasibility study to look at a number of critical issues. Um, this is probably more detailed than you want to know, but it really was a prospective observational study to look at what happens when people are admitted to the hospital for IV therapy of an exacerbation. This was a, uh, really an information gathering study in which there were really no prescriptions in terms of what kind of treatment was going to be done, but rather a collection of data as to what clinicians um, did and what were their endpoints when they admitted a patient. Uh, admitted uh, included patients 12 and older, uh, hospitalized for an exacerbation. Uh, excluded patients that were really outside that range of a typical exacerbation and collected a, a wealth of data. And the primary endpoints, again, were the feasibility and determining the clinical equipoise of future trials to really look and gather information to um, develop some guidelines for how we manage exacerbations. Because if anybody went to yesterday's symposium on pulmonary exacerbations, there is a tremendous variation in how we manage exacerbations in our patients. Um, the design of the study was basically outlined here. Patients were admitted. Um, they stayed in the hospital as long as a clinician deemed necessary uh, and then were followed up at 28 days. This is, uh, was a very big study. 220 patients who were enrolled over one year, over 10 sites. Uh, and that gave a lot of information about the rate of enrollment and, and what is a feasible sample size to be achieved. Because it may take a, a rather large study to get at some of these questions. The conclusions were that they achieved their goals and they received uh, the information needed to plan the next study. They were able to establish equipoise in terms of how the study would be designed. And it was really critical in uh, defining what the next steps were going to be. One important thing uh, was realized is that in order to make a feasible study, you really had to get buy-in from the, a broader CF community, both clinicians and patients and caregivers. And this was a, another example of how important it is to do a broad survey uh, to understand uh, what our larger community really wants uh, addressed. So when physicians were uh, asked what the key questions were, the majority of them said the duration of therapy was a, a really, really important thing to identify. Uh, and in terms of what key outcomes to be measured, lung function by FEV1, and a relief of symptoms. On the other hand, if you ask the patient and caregivers what their goals of treatment were, um, 
the vast majority were primarily concerned with the complete relief of symptoms, as opposed to a much smaller number who were focused on recovery of symptoms. However, both patients and caregivers understood that physicians paid attention to both uh, improvement in symptoms and uh, improvement in lung function. So uh, I think we get our message across, but it's important for us to appreciate what it is our patients are paying attention to. They want to feel a lot better. So patients are willing to participate in this kind of study. It's really important to know before it's being developed that for them clinic, uh, clinical symptom resolution is really important. They trust their physicians to do the right thing. However, they're worried that perhaps we may pick a trial that is too short or keep them on therapy uh, much too long. I'm going to switch gears and talk about one other trial that was recently completed that relates to pulmonary exacerbations, and that's really the EICE study. And this is a uh, multi-center trial that looked, uh, that looked at um, monitoring uh, at home of both symptoms and lung function. This was initiated by the team at Johns Hopkins University of Washington and then expanded a year later to include more sites in the TDN. And uh, again, here's one of the, port the photograph shows the small spirometer that was used at home that pa patients uh, track their symptoms and their spirometric values. And their hypothesis was that early identification of an acute exacerbation will improve lung function uh, measured by FEV1. So did home monitoring trigger uh, visits? Yes, for sure. Uh, the type of alarms were primarily because of a decrease in FEV1 or worsening symptoms. Uh, and the response typically triggered an acute visit. So monitoring leads to more visits. Question is, did home monitoring affect the outcome? So to know the answer to that, you have to go to workshop 26, um, which will be uh, later today. So you have to pick between infection or exacerbations. So having gone through these various themes, um, we now have to look at what are the studies that are underway or starting soon. Um, and if it's not possible to, call, to talk about all the studies that have been completed, uh, it's actually much more difficult to talk about the studies that are upcoming because it would take too much time to actually even just read the names of the studies. Um, so these are the studies that are going to be coming up in 2015, as best we can tell. These are the CFTR modulators. These are the anti-inflammatory drugs. These are the studies examining anti-infective treatments. And the studies looking at restoring airway surface liquid. And finally, uh, not finally, uh, second to last nutritional studies. It's a very long list. And finally, observational studies, some of which are looking at really key biomarkers and other things as we roll out some of our uh, breakthrough treatments. So this is a pretty daunting list. Another way of looking at it is, well, so how many studies is this really? You know, I see this big list, it fills one slide, but maybe it's not so bad. So this is how bad it is. Um, on this graph, you can see in yellow and red the studies that are in startup. And in the 2015 panel, you can see what we projected for this year. And in fact, we generally overestimate the projected just to get prepared. But in fact, what happened was that there were more studies that were uh, starting up and ongoing. Uh, so the pace is really picking up. And if we look forward to 2016, there'll be as many studies in startup and even more studies that are ongoing. So this is going to have a major impact on our community. The other way to look at the impact is, so how many patients are going to be involved? So this is the trend that we've seen over time and the projections for 2016. So hopefully there, nobody is having any uh, mistakes about, are we going to get busier? Is there going to be a greater demand on our system? Uh, so the way to cope with this is to figure out, okay, so what doors do we need to open to improve access for everybody, uh, to manage the increasing needs for the research programs, uh, for our care centers, and for our patients? So Bob alluded to the fact that we started the Therapeutics Development Network in 1998. And this is really established to really accelerate the pace of evaluation of new therapies. But during that time, we also developed the highest standards for patient safety, the best design for studies, the optimum number of patients that may be needed in a trial, so that we had enough to reach a conclusion and avoid the problem early in uh, CF research, which was many studies were underpowered 
and, and we could not make any conclusions. But we really don't want to enroll more patients than we actually need to complete the study. We also were, have been addressing the need for safety and optimization of trials with our many study sponsors that are coming to us with new protocols or for consultation. And we really, really have to reflect the priorities of the CF community as to what needs to be studied uh, and what is the most important kind of study to do. So this is a timeline of our capacity. When the TDN was founded in 1998, there were eight centers that were collaborating. We expanded to 18 in 2003. By 2009, we had 77 centers uh, collaborating in the TDN. And currently, we have 82. So this has been a steady growth to meet the, or the rising demand for more and more studies that bring more and more therapies to our patients. It's a measure of our success. But when I look at this, I realize that this is really not the entire research network. The entire research network is the entire care center network because this is really where it's happening. This is where, where the conversations begin. And even beyond this, we have a worldwide network. We have CF centers in many continents and many countries. North America, it's Canada, and the United States. We have Australia and New Zealand. We have Europe. Europe uh, the European community established a clinical trials network in 2008 that has, this past year, expanded to 43 sites, all collaborating, that span 15 countries and over 17,000 patients. So uh, it is a, a very welcome and robust expansion. So given this worldwide network, you know, do we really have any worries? You know, can we actually meet the demand that we have for many studies that are coming up that are very compelling, very important, and will change our patients' lives? So I want to point out two things that, in fact, should worry us to a degree. This is an example of a study that um, failed to enroll. Uh, despite changing the timelines and changing the inclusion-exclusion criteria, it was stopped prematurely. Uh, so this could have a huge impact if there's a potentially effective therapy that never makes it to a conclusion and that drug development program ends prematurely. We may lose a therapy that could have been beneficial simply because we could not enroll it. The other thing to realize is that there may be studies that look at uh, approved therapies, comparing which is better or what combination of therapies may be effective. Uh, if we don't complete those studies, insurance companies may decide they're simply not going to pay. So both of these possibilities would have tremendous impact for our patients. The other thing to realize is that there are barriers to enrolling patients in studies. In this survey we did of TDN sites, we found that the adequate amount of RC support or issues with protocols were things that really were uh, presenting a real problem for some of our research centers. These have been addressed. There are more research quarters now in the sites performing research. We've worked harder and harder to help open up restrictive protocols to make, make sure they're feasible and they can enroll. But the other thing is that um, there's a perception that our patients um, may not be very willing to participate and that it really is a substantial view of the research teams. So that's something we have to address. Um, I'm going to pause and have you reflect on Stonehenge. This is a very old site, um, one that I was near when I was traveling in England uh, this past year, but I didn't actually go there. I went to uh, Averbury, which is uh, also a magnificent part of England. Um, so what I want us to reflect on is that if there's a perception that there's an inner circle that's doing the research, that has really got the keys to getting all the research done, uh, I think we need to dispel that myth and we need to start doing that now. Because in reality, uh, the patient and their doctor and the care center team are the people that are at the center of that circle. They're the ones having the conversation that really starts the ball rolling to think about being in a trial, to think about whether the trial is right for them, to think about you know, this is going to uh, cause undue risks or an undue burden. Uh, it really, really begins there. So if we're going to open the door to our patients to consider research, um, that's really where, where we have to begin. And I can't think of anybody better to talk about this than our patient uh, who we heard from earlier. My name is Linda Bowman. I'm 54 years old, and I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when I was three. I enjoy nature, I love dancing, I've been um, a fan of the arts from when I was a little girl, um, but I really, really enjoy uh, the human contact and helping people more than anything. 
I've enjoyed participating in clinical trials um, basically because I know that they are helping the greater good. Uh, the first trial I was ever in was the Pulmazine study and that was a huge thing because uh, that was the first uh, drug that the FDA uh, marketed and approved for cystic fibrosis. So participating in a clinical trial knowing that something in the future is going to be of benefit it's like a, it's a huge gift and it's such a blessing for me to be able to do that. I like to learn about clinical trials first and foremost from my doctor because I feel like he knows me best. I see him all the time. I, I do get to see the care team, but my doctor is the go-to guy. And he knows all the little ins and outs of what my health is exactly that day. Um, so when I go to hear about a study, I want to hear it from him first. When I hear about a clinical trial, one of the most important things that I want to hear first is, is my safety. That first and foremost, they have my health, my health status up front and that they're concerned about that before they're concerned about filling a spot for the study. So I think it makes a big difference when you hear that we've got your back, we know what your health status is right now, we are going to protect that and do everything we can and we'll go from there. You know, I would love to hear about clinical trials, whether I could participate in them or not. It really makes a difference to me because I'm always trying to think of the greater good of the community. So it's very clear that we need to listen um, to the CF community to know what we need to do next to accomplish this. Um, we are fortunate to have the results of a very extensive survey of 760 adults with CF and the parents of children with CF. And some of the questions I'm going to share with you this morning. So what's the overall interest level in therapies to treat the basic defect of CF? Things like Ivacaftor, Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor. So not surprisingly, 85% of our patients are very interested in, in um, trials of this nature. Um, what about other therapies, things to treat other serious and chronic problems, uh, studies of antibiotics and anti-inflammatory therapies, or things to affect uh, nutrition and digestion? Still, 76% is a very large number of patients that would be interested in participating. If that's good news. How about um, where do our patients get their information? So if we look at where the sources of data are, um, who tells them about um, participating in a clinical trial? 70%, kind of as Linda said, um, prefer discussing clinical trial participation with their physician, not necessarily with the research team first. And if you look at the perception of PIs and uh, research coordinators about who at your center talks about research, in fact, the vast majority of those discussions are carried out by the study PI or the research coordinator, and only about a third are uh, handled by the uh, CF clinician. So in participating in clinical trials, how do patients find out? If you look at the patients that participated and the patients that have not participated, the ones that have not participated are off on their own finding out about clinical trials. So nobody's apparently talking to them very often. But the ones that do participate, somebody at the care center almost two-thirds of the time has had a discussion with them. So that's successful. And if you look at the patients who've not participated in a clinical trial and you ask, uh, have you ever been asked to participate, 78% have never been asked. So that's a huge number. A lot of potential, a lot of um, par um, possibilities. In terms of barriers to participation, I alluded to this before, not qualifying, not being asked, and not knowing about clinical trials, you know, lead the list. But also there is a serious concern about negative side effects, so that's something that has to be addressed. And then increasing someone's comfort with participation. You really need to highlight the importance of um, a patient's safety being in a trial, that they would be removed if there was some threat to their safety, that their clinical care and well-being was always paramount and took precedence over the study, knowing the risks and benefits of participation and knowing exactly what the trial uh, entails is really important. 
So this is really about the conversations that we have in clinic with our patients as part of the clinic visits. So what do we discuss? I think that generally we can give updates on uh, research or um, new research breakthroughs and what it's uh, like to be in a trial. Uh, or our patients may come to us with questions and we've got to figure out a way to get those answers very quickly so that we can address them uh, in a reasonable fashion. Or we can choose to actually talk to them about a trial that's going on that they may not know about. So we all, again, need a source of information to stay current with what's available at our sites or regionally. When you talk about patients with, uh, talk to patients about research, you always need to be very clear about the distinction of um, providing care clinically versus providing the opportunity to be in research. Um, because in that situation, we play a dual role, and it's important to separate the conversations as being about one or the other. Addressing safety is a high priority for our patients, and we need to continue to do a better job of sharing information with all of the clinicians at our centers. But the reality is we have a lot of constraints in our time when we're in clinic. There's a lot to get done. Um, a lot of demands on clinical productivity. So this is a hard question to answer. Uh, I don't know that I have great answers for everybody. But one thing that on the, that's on the horizon is that we expect that in the future there's going to be a greater emphasis on outcomes. And so the CF community is already way ahead on this because we have been the beneficiary of a lot of quality improvement programs and have been looking at outcomes year after year after year. So we are ready ahead of the curve on this. So it makes sense to me that we approach the same, this issue the same way we've looked at quality improvement about clinical care. We look at ways to improve our efficiencies in talking about research. Um, and there are a number of ways we can do this. But we need more tools uh, so we can do this in an efficient way uh, and informative way. And this is really going to be uh, a growing uh, set of resources on the CF Foundation website. If you haven't seen the new website format, I encourage you to go there soon. Under the tab on our research, you can go and you can look at where, uh, where clinical trials are occurring and you can search for specific clinical trials um, under a certain search tool. This is where, this will be the home for a lot of the ongoing things that we're going to be developing to make this an easier process and a more successful process for everybody. This is an example of spreadsheets which many of you have gotten that illustrate the details about uh, studies that are ongoing. It gives you a lot of information that can be shared with patients about the studies uh, and inclusion exclusion criteria so you can have a more informative discussion. And we also have these wonderful infographics that are being developed that get back to some of the basics for patients of ours that are not as familiar with clinical research or to give us a quick update as to what's a phase two or a phase three study and what are the key things to tell somebody about that. So we're going to continue working on this. We're going to continue updating and expanding our resources for all the care centers. Um, also to provide resources to talk about the issue of safety and the important role of the DSMB in our clinical trials. And continue to send spreadsheets out to the sites so that you have an ongoing supply of new information. Um, in the future, we're going to be able to send out even more refined lists about specific patients who may qualify because we heard from the center directors that they would like a piece of paper as they go into a patient's room that will tell them what they need to know about what study this person is going to be eligible for. Or for the younger uh, clinicians in the crowd to go to the website and, and go through one portal and you get information about the clinical status of the patient and right next to it you can find out what studies they may be eligible for. So it will take some uh, merging of various databases and systems, but this is all feasible. I mean, we are living in an incredible information technology age. But one thing we have to realize is that not every CF center, no matter how large, can offer research study to every one of their patients. So we have to learn to share. Um, and we're going to hear one more video. We can do to uh, get clinical trials done efficiently and to move CF research forward is to make sure that we are all thinking about the ongoing trials, not just at our CF centers, but everywhere so that we can make sure that our patients and their families understand the opportunities to participate um, and keep research on their radar screen. I think that there are ways to leverage all of the patient and family engagement efforts that the CF Foundation has made on local and regional levels to help raise awareness. For example, family advisory boards at CF centers could 
discuss with the clinicians at their centers how they would like to see this communication come out. In other words, what are their ideas on what might make them participate and what might make them feel safe if they are referred outside for a trial? The Greater Illinois Chapter of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been instrumental in getting centers from Illinois and from Milwaukee together to think about how we can best communicate and make sure that everyone knows what trials are going on. This takes a lot of communication, but the main basis of it is really goodwill and relationships and setting this as a goal for everyone and not just those of us who are within the TDN network. The McGuire family has been very interested in research since their daughter was diagnosed after newborn screening. So when they were very interested in going to another center in an adjacent state for a study, we uh, supported them and facilitated that so that she could be a subject there. We've participated in several clinical trials throughout Claire's life, um, three in particular, uh, one of which was a, a remote study uh, in Indianapolis, which was really great to find out from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation through our care center here in Chicago. The experience going to Indianapolis was fantastic. Uh, it provided an opportunity for my wife, uh, Claire, and I to have a, a little independent time to go to a different care center and ex experience another city. What was really fantastic about that was the, the care that we got uh, in Indianapolis was just the same as that we got here in Chicago. You know, we were a little bit uh, trepidatious about you know going to a different care center, but very quickly, uh, warm faces and, and open hearts you know brought us to a place where uh, we felt part of a, a larger community. In order to make sure that there are smooth operations, to think of this as a system that integrates the clinical and research care is essential. And frankly, that is what our patients and families expect. They are seen in a system of care, whether that involves only one center or many CF centers, and we owe it to them to make sure that it's seamless. So we have the, a number of wonderful tools that help with this referral process. Research centers um, themselves have tools that help structure the referral of patients to other research centers. And uh, it allows us to achieve the goal of seamless integration of clinical care and research that we heard is the expectation when this happens. Because there has to be excellent communication and coordination for families to make this uh, work. Because they may want to come back and, and do this again. Um, the, in, the team from Chicago mentioned the existence of regional collaborations. Tomorrow I'm going to be flying to Miami to take part in a growing collaboration in South Florida where centers are coming together to, with their affiliate, uh, uh, with their chapter to uh, really discuss what's going on in research and thinking about building stronger bridges between their institutions and sharing patients uh, who want to participate in clinical trials. However, this is uh, an additional workload on our teams. Um, it takes time to get medical records and to communicate and to really bridge between the, re the research site and the referral site or the clinical care center. So we've recognized that um, we need to think about compensating for this extra time. It seems like a very uh, basic thing and now I think that there's a possibility of actually doing this. So um, the Clinical Research Referral Support Program, or CRISP, uh, is going to be rolled out. Uh, I believe there will be a lot more detail about this at the Senate Director's meeting tomorrow, and more details will come uh, after the CF conference uh, to all the centers so that you can see how this may fit for you. So, um, I wasn't sure I was going to get through this part. Um, so I want to tell you about my, my patient, Wells. Um, I have his permission and his parents' permission to tell his story. Um, and I've had the privilege of being his doctor since uh, 2011. So Wells has CF, and among other things he's passionate about, like school, basketball, wrestling with his older brothers, he likes to paint. He paints a stunning picture uh, every year for our major CF fundraising event, and it's always a picture of roses. Not surprising. These original paintings are auctioned off and fetch a very, very high price, um, a bidding war. Uh, and it's so exciting to see 
that happened, and I, I'm so proud of him when it, when it occurs. So he started this in 2008, um, and here he, this is a picture of him in, uh, in 2010, at age 10. Um, and this money has gone to support CF Research, and these are his paintings uh, over the years. Um, and I have a poster of one of these in my office because they're just too expensive to, uh, to actually <laughs> to buy at the thing. I think uh, mainly the corporate sponsors are the ones that are uh, the uh, most successful bidders. So it's a wonderful story. Um, and one of the things that is so nice is that his parents' emails uh, signature line includes a quote from him, something he said in 2007. There's a cure, you know. You just haven't found it yet. So, <clears throat> this is a slide of Wells, age 14, this summer. So this year, the research he's invested in <clears throat> has really paid off. This is him with his first box of um, Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor. So we know it's not a cure yet, um, but it's a huge step forward uh, along the road to a cure. So this is why we do research, um, and this is why it matters so much. It's for our patients and the additional years we give them to have full lives. So they can play ball, and wrestle with their siblings and eventually wrestle with their children and then continue to help others. So uh, the change I talked about is happening now. Um, and the pace of this change is increasing faster and faster. And as Bob said, this train is moving so fast, you know, once you get on, you can't get off uh, for fear of your uh, health and well-being. Um, so even though it's increasing at this rapid pace, I, I cannot forget the words from another one of my patient's mothers. It was at the end of a conversation about CF research, and it sums up her view of the work that's still ahead. It was very simple. We, still, we just don't have time to waste. So thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference.